All right. Hello, hello. This is Abel Pacheco. Uh, we have another amazing guest, Mr. Ryan Carrier. Ryan, we're excited to have you. Thanks for joining, man. How's it going? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Yeah, man. We're, we appreciate it. And we uh, look forward to having a great conversation because uh, Ryan is in day-to-day operations, like helping people reduce their taxable income through real estate, making sure that uh, the, all their taxes are paid or done correctly, done cr- you know within the IRS rules and regulations. However, he's also making sure that people don't owe more than they should. <laughs> and that's the key. We want to make sure that well, we're making as much money as possible, but more importantly, we're keeping as much of that as possible. If there are certain rules and regs that the IRS provides, uh, we want to make sure we take advantage of and play uh, like the, the wealthy do. And, um, I'm excited to have him. So Ryan, thanks for joining us. Why don't you tell us, you know, you know, give give us in in your own words, tell us who you are and what you do and we'll start a great conversation. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. Um, my, my kind of story to how I got here, uh, after graduating college, I went into corporate America and, uh, after being there for a couple of years, kind of was ready to move into my next role. Uh, basically applied for five internal positions within the company. I got zero of them. Okay. So yeah. I was, I was pretty devastated uh, internally. Just my ego was crushed and was kind of like, what's going on? Uh, you know, HR and my boss was telling me, Hey, you need new skills. You need more experience, all this stuff. Uh, so basically from there, I was like, Hey, I need to kind of reassess, you know, what's going on. What are my goals with my career and whatnot? So fast forward just a little bit uh, in that time frame after being you know rejected, a uh, really good friend of mine introduced me to Bigger Pockets, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners are uh, familiar with. Started just absorbing those podcasts uh, back in 2016, 2017, uh, back then, and found one of the podcasts where uh, they had CPAs who specialized in just real estate tax. And at the time, I was just like, "This is super cool." You know, being an accountant. Uh, soon in that time, uh, time period got my CPA and I was like, this is awesome. You know, maybe, maybe I could do this. And so there's just kind of this spark after listening to, I think there was two podcasts that they did on bigger pockets. And I was just like absorbing all this information, you know, Amanda Hahn, uh, Tom Wheelwright, all those kind of books for like tax-free wealth, uh, you know, real estate tax strategies, all that stuff, just absorbing that, uh, as much as I could. And then just, again, determined, hey, I'm going to specialize just in real estate tax. And uh, that's through a couple other firms and experiences kind of led me to uh, the real estate CPA or Hall CPA. And uh, now I just get to advise clients and teach them kind of what I've learned over the last couple of years. Yeah, that is awesome. Thank you very much for sharing. We appreciate it. Um, You know what I, I love hearing about your story is, you know, you looked and sought for and received some education from a source and that education uh, led you down this path of like, wow, I can, I can have some expertise. I can do what I really want to do, invest in real estate, and then also take you know, the tax strategy part of it. But you took action, man. You took action. You went after it. And now you're here working with you know, one, one, one of those, the uh, top experts in the country. So we're excited, man. We're excited. Yeah. Awesome. Excited to be here too. Yeah, and I, I like uh, Tom Wheelwright. I I I think heard him first in maybe twenty around the same time, 2017, 2018, really? um, in that area. And I uh, picked up at least one of his books. I know he's probably got a couple. And then um, in that area, that's when we were just moving to to uh, multifamily. But I hadn't heard the term bigger pockets. I didn't heard heard of the website, heard of the group, heard of the blog. I'm like, what is that bigger pockets? And right around that time, uh, we were paying for education. And then I was like, oh, I found about this this resource that I was like has a bunch of the terms I'm learning on for free. But anyways, it, it, it you, we learn uh, something, but more importantly, we take action. Man, you're you're right in there, so I love it. I love yeah. it. So before we move to the tax strategy, because Ryan, you you help a bunch of investors tax strategy all the time. Um, I do want to uh, congratulate you on your little one. So I know Ryan <laughs> just had a little one, a month old son, probably getting no sleep. What's going on <laughs> at the house, man? How are you? 
<laughs> How are you holding up? Uh, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, my wife is a saint. Uh, she is doing a really good job taking care of him throughout the nights. Uh, so I can be pretty fresh uh, during the weekdays to do my, to do my job and, and do things like this. So uh, hats off to, to her and just, uh, yeah, she's awesome. I'm very blessed to have uh, a, a wife we, like her. So we're, we're all very blessed to have wives like like her right so <laughs> I, I use it the blanket term her because i have i have a wife like her that i'm like super thankful that she takes care of our children and my wife leslie and man without her like I, we wouldn't have been able to do anything she's the she's the key partner she's the key team member she's the leader right that allows us to do everything else so that's that's awesome man praise god for, yeah. for wonderful wives right yeah uh good man well so um that's your first one. Congratulations. Thank you. Tell us how, how that kind of plays into the real estate investing. Like what, is this a mindset for you, a paradigm shift? Is this the reason for, uh, you know, how, how do you view all of your real estate investing in general, you know, when it relates to your family as well? Yeah, that, that's, that is such a big piece of why I'm so uh, mindful and careful of kind of our financial situation and um, now having our son, uh, even more so things just feel real, uh, to me and feel more weighty, uh, overall. So, uh, you know, I could talk for quite a while about kind of ideas for when he's a little older and he can kind of start getting involved in the work, uh, and whatnot. And I think we'll talk about that in just a moment, but overall from just a kind of a real estate and even, uh, you know, perspective of kind of passing down, everyone has kind of different, you know, opinions on what they want to do on passing wealth down to their kids, kind of the generational wealth. Um, you know, I think me and my wife are still trying to figure that out exactly, but whether it's passing down a bunch of real estate or we cap it and give a bunch away, right. To charity, some sort of nonprofits, uh, church, whatever that, that is something that everyone needs to decide, but no matter what my first and primary focus is to, uh, continue to pursue that financial freedom. Uh, and that is going to come about um, for my family for multiple generations when I can continue to teach my kids and then their kids and then their kids and then their kids. It's not to me just about passing along money. It's about passing along education so that they can do it themselves, right? I want to teach them how to fish, not just give them a fish. Uh, that's kind of my mindset of just how important education is uh, because, again, that knowledge, that understanding, that wisdom is worth way more than any sort of, in my opinion, real estate, because we have people out there who can receive a bunch of wealth, inherit it, doesn't mean that they're going to be a good steward of that down the road, or their kids might not be. Um, I think there's a stat out there that, you know, once you get to the third generation of a very wealthy family, it's usually that third generation or the grandkids that kind of squander it, right? And I think it's because there's no education that's passed along from that first generation, millionaire or billionaire, or whatever, who didn't pass along that work ethic and that education to the next generation. And then they don't do that because they don't understand it to the grandkids, right? So the education piece is just so important to me. It's so much more than just finances or money or, you know, financial independence. It's about that education so that they can go and do it themselves. That's what it yeah. is for me. Yeah. Well, man, what a, what a huge motivation um, for, for uh, you and a lot of us. I resonate with a lot of things you mentioned, man. It's like, how do we create financial freedom? How do we get the generational uh, wealth going? How do we pass that education on? Because if we don't pass it to our little ones, then they're not going to know. Their kids are not going to know. I uh, I heard this. I heard this story uh, somewhere as well, and it was like the fact that uh, my grandfather had to walk. 10 miles to get to work, right? Mm. Before he worked all day. And my dad had to, you know, do X, Y, and Z to get to work back then. And now I get to drive a beautiful car and my son will have X, Y, Z better car than I will when he, when he drives there, his, his children and children, but uh, they may be walking again. And <laughs> the point was, if you don't pass down, not only the wealth, but the education right. or the determination, the perseverance, the work ethic, what all the things that our, our grandparents and parents before us already laid the track. And we now have the benefit or the advantage of, of, you know, in this position, well, we need to make sure that education gets transferred also. 
uh, not only of how to invest and what to do with the wealth and how to create it, how to make it, but man, there's also, you know, work ethic and determination, perseverance that a lot of us are going to have to go to just to create it. And if you're already at the maintain part, you know, make sure your children get that. And, uh, you know, so absolutely, man, I agree with you. Yeah, hundred percent agree. It's, it's not only even like the knowledge of like, here's what money is, here's what an asset is, here's what a liability is, or it's not just about the amount that you give them to give them a head start. But like, you're kind of, kind of saying like, it's that character too, right? The character aspects of who they are, that they have good character to have that work ethic, that perseverance, determination. I how to hundred percent agree with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. So you mentioned asset liability. We talked uh, for a minute about um, our uh, strategies for our children, uh, which I want to break into a moment. And maybe we'll start. We'll start there, dude. You you look at a ton of tax returns. You look at a ton of businesses. They're in, in, entrepreneurs, people that are coming to you with the numbers, <laughs> and they're like, "How do I do this?" Right. Uh, maybe you can start there. Like, tell us who um, your normal clients are and why they come to you. Yeah. So most of the clients that I have that I work with on kind of an advisory kind of ongoing basis mm-hmm. uh, is kind of a net worth, you know, somewhere between I'd say around a million dollars to maybe five. That's kind of my uh, normal kind of group. Maybe a little less than a million to kind of start at, at kind of a minimum, mm-hmm. but most folks are coming to us because they have real estate uh, and they have a CPA, okay, who generally speaking is a generalist, right? Their mm-hmm. CPA does not understand real estate professional status, doesn't understand the short-term rental strategy, doesn't understand or doesn't even know what a cost segregation study is, right? And so they're doing all this research telling their generalist CPA, hey, I want to pursue or I want to implement these strategies. And the, te- the CPA is like, okay, you know, I don't know what those are, or they have to do the research, or they can't advise them on how to meet that. They're so um, kind of retroactive. They're not helping them be proactive uh, in all of the kind of strategies that they en- can implement. So where we come in is we say, you know, this is all we do. We, we are just a real estate tax kind of niche firm, CPA firm. Uh, we have all different kind of services and whatnot. But we help advise clients, kind of educate them on the rules. And then we say, because these are the rules, here's how you can implement this for your properties, for your goals, for your situation, whether it's today, you know, yesterday, or into the future. Uh, we're kind of trying to give them a roadmap, uh, or we call you know, sometimes the blueprint, to kind of help them guide uh, kind of the future years so that they can properly pr- uh, plan and you know, kind of estimate what are going to be their potential tax savings if they implement certain strategies. So yeah, kind of that one to five million is kind of my uh, client group and just advising them on various strategies to, to implement. Got it. Okay. So that makes sense. Real estate investors, uh, net worth a million dollars plus, and they are trying to figure out um, implementing some of the strategies. They've already been investing but they don't have an expert to kind of advise or guide them through. And, you know, in anything we attempt to do, any new uh, venture, man, I want an advisor. I want somebody to guide me. I want somebody like a professional, somebody that's already been through the, 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 you know, the obstacles and challenges and then lead me. I mean, that's, that's the best way. That's the way I started investing is looking for mentors. And that's the way, you know, people will come to ask us now. It's like, how do, how do I figure this stuff out? So anyways, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, so the people that are winning, what do you see that they're doing that the people that are, are not, or your highest, you know, the highest earning versus the people that are kind of on the bottom uh, rung, what are they doing differently than everybody else? Yeah, I would say just in my experience, in my, my kind of opinion, some of those top kind of, you know, net worth, you know, uh, clients and whatnot, like you're mentioning, they are owning businesses and in large real estate, uh, in my opinion, Uh, you know, I know this is not a business podcast, but that that can be a big portion of your net worth to build a business and uh, then sell it or continue to grow it until you want to sell it, right? In a decade or a couple of decades or pass that along, whatever. Um, they generally, you know, own businesses, right? And they're they're starting from the ground up or they're taking something that's very small, you know, buying a small company and then growing it substantially. Um, you know, the multiples that you can get from a businesses uh, from a business. Uh, you know, EBITDA or profits, whatever, 
is just so substantial. But then not only that, like I said, real estate. Uh, and generally speaking, I would say they do own kind of the bigger multifamily uh, properties or uh, you know, they own big kind of beach homes and they're able to rent it out for you know, 500 bucks a night or whatever. Uh, their, their assets are so big. Um, and as they continue to pay down the debt or they receive income, right, the numbers just get bigger as they scale. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm seeing. Their, their assets are huge, uh, even though their liabilities are huge too. Uh, they're just going big. Uh, and honestly, it takes some time. It takes capital to do that. It takes confidence you know, to go from, you know, five single families to, you know, 10 apartment buildings, but through just the education and seeking mentors and advisors and all those things, I think they've just done that over time. So short answer is they get big businesses and they get big real estate uh, to help support their, you know, growth. All right. I love it. So you want to make, you want to have the highest net worth possible. You want to do things that other people are not doing, then you need to buy bigger assets by businesses, be an entrepreneur, and you want to have another word I, I heard was liabilities, big assets, big liabilities. Man, those are those two things are sometimes in people's mindsets like, no, I, I can't be in debt. But if you have big assets, you're going to have big liabilities if you're using leverage, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can use that leverage, you know, to your advantage to, you know, even if you pay off, you know, an asset for a long time or you pay off your debt for a long time great. Maybe you consider refinancing, which is not a taxable event. Refinance that property, take out a bunch of your equity, go buy another property. You know, So taking, taking advantage of debt when it's you know, wise to do so uh, can be a, just a huge leverage. Obviously, that's why we use the word leverage. Uh, leverage to help you acquire more properties and, and get bigger. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah. And while we're on with the, with the CPA, right? Uh, some people let's, let's go from a basic strategy to maybe a little bit more technical. One of the basic ones that Ryan mentioned is refinancing a property. Did you know you can refinance a property, pull capital out of it, and it's a non-taxable cash event, meaning I can go back to the, <laughs> to the bank, refinance, get a new loan, pull my equity out, and ultimately that's non-taxable. So that's a basic one that a lot of people are leveraging. Uh, maybe you've never heard of that. That's a basic one. You need to check it out. Let's move to a little bit more complex while we have you. Um, there's a couple of strategies that I, I recently heard, right? It's the million dollar vacation property. <laughs> um, I usually stray away from a, a Airbnb or short term other than I'm a, I'm a user of it. But man, <laughs> you, you know, kind of heard this new strategy from you. And I'd love to hear more about you know, how we can leverage vacation rentals to not only have uh, income, but also losses, which I think is the base of what we're doing, get a good amount of depreciation to wipe out our active income, not just passive income. So that's why I want to I make sure we, we qualify this, Ryan. So tell us, tell us this new strategy, man, from the mindset of. Yeah. So what what's tough about most Americans, okay, most of probably your listeners, you know, a lot of them are, you know, maybe W-2 employees, okay? In order for them to, uh, you know, take real estate and have that be considered a non-passive uh, activity, kind of like what you're saying, they either need to meet, you know, somehow real estate professional status, or they can use the short-term rental strategy, okay? Either one of those strategies is going to help them take that real estate, rental real estate, and make it a non-passive activity, which then in the end can offset their W-2 income or if they're a business owner, their business income. That's that's kind of the goal. That's kind of what this does. Okay. So what's cool about the, re the short-term rental strategy, it's kind of made up of two steps. Okay. So the first step basically is that you have an average stay per guest uh, of seven days or less. Okay. That's the first step. So that's very common for you know these Airbnb, VRBO properties, these beach homes, you know, you have these stays that are maybe, you know, long weekends. Maybe you have someone stay there for 10 days once. It's just that you need to get that average stay at the end of the year for the property, seven days or less. Okay. So that's the first step. Okay. The second part is that you materially participate in your short-term rental property. Okay. There's, there's seven total material participation tests. Uh, the two that I'll just highlight that are the most common uh, are number one, you either work 100 hours and more than any other individual 
in the short-term rental property. Okay. So for example, if you Abel had a vacation home in, you know, Florida somewhere, uh, Destin, Florida, let's say, and you had worked 105 hours in that short-term rental property, and then you had a cleaner, right? Who's doing the cleaning because you're in Texas and in your properties in Florida, you need a cleaner, you need a team. If they get cleaning hours of, let's say, I don't know, 40 hours, great. You've actually met the test because you got your hundred plus hours and it's more than your cleaner who was you know, 40 or 50, whatever I just said. Um, so that would work for material participation. The other one though, that you can use is 500 hours. Okay. So if you meet that seven day test, that's the first step. And then in that second part, again, material participation, getting 500 hours working in that short-term rental is going to meet that material participation test. So again, meeting both of those, you've now taken that short-term rental, maybe this million dollar you know, beach home uh, that's maybe producing a lot of cash flow, and it's now considered a non-passive activity, okay? which now pushes that into the same bucket as your W-2 income or your business income. okay? So that's the first step. Then the second part to kind of finish this, to get that huge loss that we, we really love real estate for is to do that cost segregation study. Right. So finishing that kind of strategy, get that cost segregation study done. Um, I will say 2022 is the last year for 100% uh, bonus depreciation. So you'd want to have the property placed in service by December 31st, 2022. If you wait till 2023, we're going to talk about different numbers. But yeah, getting that cost seg, meeting those tests, it's going to like significantly wipe out your, your taxable income. All right. I love it. So Let's. I'm gonna break this down for you know for maybe for the lay for the lay person, right? It's uh, somebody like me, which is there are benefits for real estate investing that a real estate quote unquote real estate professional receives that the average person does not, and those those extra tax benefits that a real estate professional gets are so massive. They're so unfair. Uh, we take advantage of them every time because we want to be the real estate professional in the in the you know in the tax return. And I want to take as much passive income, passive losses, uh, sorry, passive losses to negate any active income that I take. So as a real estate professional, I get to do that. If you're not a real estate professional, you can't. You can't do this. There's no material participation. You are not a real estate quote unquote investor by the IRS, right? But what people are always looking for is a way to get that status. And this is another way to get a status because that short-term rental is that material participation. It is under seven days, it becomes or classifies like a hotel-ish. It's more active than a normal rental where I just rent it and it stays leased all year long. Is that, that's essentially the mindset. Is that right, Ryan? That's essentially it. And okay. just to make one more distinction, uh, mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned the phrase like real estate professional. Mm -hmm. Generally mm -hmm. speaking, that that kind of real estate professional status that we normally talk about, uh, which I think you've talked about that maybe on a, a podcast a few years ago yeah. Uh, yeah. for your listeners, uh, that's generally for things like your apartment buildings, uh, your multifamily, anything that is like that 12-month lease, yep. that's like a, a long-term rental that kind of falls underneath the real estate rental. professional status. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then on the other side, kind of over here, then we've got that beach home, that vacation home, or the short-term rental. That strategy is so good for people who are even like employed, uh, because if I go back to the real estate professional status, you have to work more than half your time uh, in real estate alone. So for people like me with a full-time job, that's that's impossible, right? Working forty hours a week, I can't meet real estate professional status. But what I can do because of the test is just seven days and material participation, that test is so much easier for yeah. pretty much everyday people compared to trying to meet that more than half my time. Basically, you got to be in real estate full time. Yeah. So it, this is it. so applicable to, to nearly everyone, uh, which yeah. is why I love the strategy so much. Yes, sir. I, um, and there's another, I'll take a, another step back for the average <laughs> you know person listening. So cost segregation, what is a cost segregation? What is accelerated appreciation? We're leveraging some engineers that do a cost segregation study on our real estate. It depreciates faster. So instead of 27 and a half years for residential or 39 for commercial, we squeeze it down as short as term possible and maybe get all of the depreciation in the first five years or you know, sometimes last a little more, you can kind of gauge this, but you can take a ton of it at the beginning 
as opposed to the end. So Ryan mentioned uh, depreciation, cost segregation, or bonus depreciation. 100%, 100% in 2022, you've got, uh, this will air in September, 2022. <laughs> so you have two to three months if you're trying to figure out how to invest your capital today for 100% bonus depreciation, you've got to make a decision by the end of 2022. Um, if you're not making a decision, it'll go down by 20% next year to 80% and then 20% every subsequent year. So make if, if you don't have any idea what this means, uh, reach out to myself, reach out to Ryan. We're happy to help you. Essentially, I'm, we have some investments, some open investments. They're 506C. We can talk about now. If you're looking for the end of the year, you know, pop, you want to put some money in right now, let me know. And then Ryan will show you how to, how to maneuver that. Oh, Abel's going to give you a K1 loss. Ryan's going to make sure you know how to put this on your taxes if you can, you know, qualify. So this is, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. So depreciation, we killed, you know, I think, I think you're at least opening the subject with people going to reach out and vice versa on short-term rentals and segre- uh, cost segregation study. But before we go, man, we need to hit um, some of the strategies for shifting our income to our children. You got a firstborn. I got a few <laughs> little ones, a four and a three. Uh, I don't know when the right time is. So I literally have never asked this on a podcast. So exci- I'm excited. When when can I start doing this? How do I do it right way? What's what's possible? Maybe just open it up for us a little bit. Yeah. So there's a few tax court cases that have you know uh, been published. They're out there. Uh, kind of what we have seen is that once once the child is about the age of 10 years old or older, then the IRS kind of sees that as they're able to perform meaningful work. Okay, That's kind of a key phrase that we use. Uh, if you think about hiring a two-year-old, what in the world are they going to do in your business? You Can know, they maybe they, Can they Yeah, be exactly. Model? So that's actually where I was going to go. Okay. Uh, okay they, right. they, they could be a model. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know how often kids are used as models these days for, you know, yeah. a business and whatnot, but, you know, certainly they could be paid uh, as a model, but if not a model, then it's like, okay, they need to be, you know, roughly 10 years old to do that meaningful work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. So generally speaking, uh, just to get more detailed on that, um, if you're going to actually implement this, you want to have the job responsibility be reasonable and realistic and same with the pay that they're going to receive. So for example, here's what you wouldn't do. What you wouldn't do is have your kid be the CEO of your business and you pay them $100,000 a year. Okay. As a 10 year old, not realistic. You say, Absolutely not. Right. Yeah. So what you're going to do is you're going to pay them by the hour. Uh, so you're going to record their time. And then you're probably just going to be paying them minimum wage for, you know, some time until they help you do so, like some more technical things. Right. So if they get to 15, 16, they're in high school, maybe they can help you do some of that bookkeeping. Right. Maybe you pay them 20 bucks an hour instead of 15. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So paying them by the hour, paying them uh, a reasonable wage for what they're doing. That's kind of the first step when you do that. Okay. You're paying them like an employee. You're going to make this kind of formal agreement with them. Guess what? When it comes to your tax return, just like you would pay anyone else or pay any employee or independent contractor, that is going to be an expense for your business. Okay. So now if you have this additional expense for your business, you've potentially just lowered your taxable income. Okay. Maybe you've got more of a loss or you've got less income that you're showing. So great. You've just reduced your your taxable income. Okay. So that's step one. Step two if you meet kind of these various thresholds, I'll just walk through a couple. Basically, if they're under 18, if they're paid through uh, an LLC or a sole proprietorship, um, and they're paid less than the standard deduction for the year, which in 2022 is 12,950, if they kind of meet these various tests, then you aren't going to withhold tax for their income because they're not going to be required to pay any tax. So guess what? You've now just taken a deduction, step one. Now, step two, You've given your kids tax-free income. Tax-free income. Okay. So 0% tax rate, I would love to have that all day, every day, right? But to finish this beautiful strategy uh, to the end, then you take that first $6,000 that they've earned, okay? It's earned income because they worked for a business. You put that into a Roth IRA for them to grow grow tax-free forever, Mm, okay? That's the beauty of this whole test. You got to keep going. You got to keep going. It's not about... A small tax in, uh, loss, although we like it, we like the tax benefit. Then yeah. they get non-taxable income, which is cool for them. But the completion of it, right? 
Right. And what's invested cool invested in a Roth IRA that grows compounding without paying any interest at the end whenever they decide to pull it out. So Right. And I, and I had a, a LinkedIn post on this, uh, kind of walking through some of the numbers, you know, pretty conservative numbers or whatnot. And if you start them at like the age of 10, and even if they just put in, I think I had the assumption of $6,000 a year, mm-hmm. it, it turned out to be, I think, something like $60,000 by the time they're 18. Okay. Plenty, that's, plenty that's of money awesome. for college or yeah. whatever else they want to do or invest in their first property. <laughs> right. So what's cool, and maybe this is a kind of a technical part for your, your audience here, is that the dollars that you put into a Roth, okay, that, that uh, six times eight, you know, being 48, those eight years from 10 to 18, you can take that contribution money out tax and penalty free. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that 48K can then be used, like you just said, go to college buy a business, buy their first home, buy their first rental property, whatever. And it's it's then grown significantly. Okay. If you then try to take out the earnings, okay, the, the dividends, the capital gains, that part you could pay some tax or maybe penalties or whatever, but you can still take out that first contribution amount that you put in, tax and penalty free. I, I just love this strategy. And to get that money, you know, started earlier, you kind of mentioned the compounding interest. It's just kind of a, a no-brainer, right? Yeah. But yeah. not only that, okay, sorry to keep talking here, but so not good. only that, just really excited about this. Not only that, have you helped them financially? You've now given them work experience, okay, which is awesome, right? That's what we want to do. You've given them an education, right? Those kind of intangible things that they can take well beyond uh, just the financial piece, that's kind of what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, giving them more than the financial benefit, giving them that kind of character build. Uh, those resources, that education, so so priceless, you know, compared to that forty-eight thousand I mentioned. Yeah, uh, awesome. Dropping some wisdom on our <laughs> show, Ryan. We really appreciate it, and we thank you for the the investment of uh, your education into our network. I'm sure uh, people found a lot of value. Um, a few things that we want to do before Ryan leaves. Uh, one, who, like. Where do we go if we want to reach out to you and connect with you and you know we have our listener base? Where, where should they go and who do you want to reach out to you? Yeah. So if you're, if you're in real estate and you're looking for a CPA that specializes in this, if you're looking to get you know, specific real estate tax strategy uh, advice or planning, um, that's what we do. So if you, you know, are just getting started or you know, you've got that net worth kind of in that realm, uh, I think you would be, you know, at least a, a good starting point to look in with us. We have all of our clients fill out a kind of online web form. Uh, it kind of helps us kind of streamline, uh, you know, the pipeline of people who are looking to work with us. And then we have someone reach out to you, kind of our onboarding specialist, to make sure that you're a good fit. It's a good mutual fit, uh, just to make sure you understand our services, things like that. Um, I think I sent you the link, Abel. Uh, it's like the real estate cpa.com slash friends, I think is is what it is. Uh, forgive me if that's not <laughs> exactly right. Um, but they can basically fill that out, you know, put in there, hey, you know, referred by Ryan or whatever. Um, and then we'll reach back out to them and we'll get more information, figure out if it's a good fit. All right. Yeah, we'll definitely get that in the show notes uh, for sure. So we'll make sure the right link is there. So if you have, you know, want to reach out to Ryan, you can get in touch with him directly and um you know, we're we're excited here it is it's www.therealestatecpa.com forward slash friends so awesome. there it is so you guys will catch that on the show notes and that as well um a couple of things to make sure that if you're wrapping up the show you are taking some notes rewind here's another one too um i found and maybe you can validate for me I found husband and wife teams do really well. One business owner, entrepreneur, high earning income individual, and the spouse is not making as much, retire the spouse from the W-2, make them a real estate professional and have that real estate professional invest, invest, invest in things like multifamily that provide passive income that are normally not... uh, the W-2 earner would be able to write off. But now that one family member is a real estate professional, literal because they spent most of their time doing that active work, becoming a real estate professional, putting the time and hour material participation, they can offset the taxes of the other 
individual. And I think that strategy rocks. That's how I, me and my wife got started. So just wanted to share that nugget. Can you add any insight on, have you seen a lot of that? I've seen a lot of that. And I actually have quite a few clients currently kind of considering, you know, should one of the spouses either, you know, stop working full time and go either part time or completely quit and then go into self managing all of their properties uh, in order to meet the real estate professional status. So it's extremely common. Uh, my clients who are already doing this, you know, we complete, you know, their tax returns or they send me their tax returns from prior year. And it's like, look how much you saved. You know, you had this huge uh, loss from real estate. You have, you know, maybe the husband is the income earner. Here was his income. You know, the wife is, you know, working the, the real estate because she did this and met all the tests. Here's how much you lowered your income by. And then here's the tax savings. Yeah, it's 100% agree with you. It's, it's a huge strategy uh, to use that as, you know, especially husband, wife uh, combo. Yeah. I love it. And I loved hearing the business owner part of it, Ryan, we, you know, we really don't talk enough about businesses. We're going to start getting into other conversations over time. And that's one, that's one of them, right? Because the power of the business, uh, uh, business owners, not just real estate, but business ownership, you can, you know, I, I like when he said, equity multiple, you, your multiples higher than what you purchased it for, because the same thing, it's income minus expenses equals your net operating income. And you can push that NOI up. You value businesses the same way as you do apartment complexes. And I want to increase cash flow and I want to increase my investment. Well, I can increase my equity multiple or my multiple and then uh, buy selling it later at a higher income or a higher NOI. So that's the, that's the beautiful part. I guess you see a lot of that, huh? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's awesome. Well, Ryan, uh, before you go, man, I know we asked you a lot of questions. We went kind of rapid fire. Is there anything that we didn't talk about today? They were kind of hoping I asked you about, we were hoping we hit on any last words of wisdom you want to share for our guests. Really the floor is yours, man. We just want to learn from you, bro. I would say that in my opinion, I think the IRS loves real estate investors. They've given us really great tax strategies like real estate professional status, like the short-term rental uh, loophole or strategy. They've given us cost segregation studies. They've given us depreciation. They've given us 1031 exchanges. Uh, they've given us opportunity zones. So many unique things kind of uh, really that can be used by real estate investors. It, just like make sure you understand you know, more of these strategies. Work with someone, maybe like us, maybe another you know, CPA firm who understands this stuff, but make sure you understand them. Make sure you understand what are all my options out there that I can take advantage of uh, because the, the tax code is a bunch of incentives. Okay. And I think Tom Wheelwright, you know, harps on that a lot. I would agree. There's so many incentives out there. Uh, they want people to invest in real estate. They want their land in their buildings to be beautiful and habitable for people. Um, so totally, you know, just want to say that IRS loves real estate investors. Uh, they want you guys to uh, continue to invest, build more properties, build more apartment buildings, uh, do more construction uh, to, to get more uh, units out there for people to live in really good habitable places. So that's all I want to say. All right. I love it. Well, I really appreciate it. Um, I like the mindset. The IRS and the government does give the real estate investors plenty of opportunities some people call them loopholes. Um, others call them motivation to do what the government can't do. When they want something done, they give incentives and programs and things because they need something done, but they can't do it themselves, like provide enough clean, comfortable, safe, affordable housing for the United States of America, all their citizens. So they give the incentives and, and benefits to us and say, hey, man, if you can help us with this, create more housing then we'll give you these benefits. And by default, I used to think of it as paying less taxes myself, which is good for me. But also somebody showed me the bigger picture. It's like, you're paying less taxes than an individual because you're doing what government can do. And then you're employing all of these other people yeah. that are all paying taxes and they're paying all different sorts of taxes. You, you are creating more for the government. I love it, man. So it's just different paradigms, right? And uh I look forward to, uh, to taking advantage of more. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate your time, brother. Thank you, Abel. All right. Talk to you, talk to you guys. Uh, for everybody watching us on, uh, 
on Facebook. We hope you enjoy the live unedited version, uh, the live video. I think it'll be on YouTube later. F- come follow us as well. Uh, and then our podcast, the official recording will be out probably in you know next week or something. We're pretty quick on it. And uh, anybody that wants more information can connect with us. Our website is www.5talents.capital. If you want to invest, but you don't want to do any of the legwork and take any of the education, figure all the stuff, we've done a lot of it uh, for, you, for our investors. So ha- happy to connect with us. Look forward to it and see you guys later.